We lose approximately 1% of our muscle mass per year after the age of 40. Ah, 1%, what's the big deal, right? Well, for the muscular athlete, maybe the 3% loss from age 40 to 43 is barely noticeable. But what about the 25% loss by age 65? And what about that number in the unconditioned office worker who doesn't have much extra muscle to begin with? It can dramatically reduce function and decrease both quality and years of life. But the application of the research is not limited to aging. It also brings benefit to surgical outcomes, allows athletes to extend their careers, and improves the lives of your coaching clients, friends, and family members. Soon to be Dr. Julia Coletta has been focusing her research on these elements for years. She's worked very closely with Dr. Stuart Phillips, one of our most popular guests on the podcast almost four years ago, and she's here today to share her insights with all of us. Thank you for spending a few minutes of your week with us here on the Catalyst 360 podcast, your source for engaging evidence-based health, wellness, and high-performance insights. I'm your host, Dr. Brad Cooper, CEO of Catalyst Coaching 360, endurance athlete, husband of Susanna, dad, and grandpa. This discussion hits home on so many fronts related to our own lives or that of our loved ones and our coaching clients on something most people aren't even aware of. We're glad you will no longer be a part of that group when this is over. A reminder to employers, benefit consultants, and complimentary wellness providers. Catalyst Coaching 360 not only offers coaching to support the physical and mental well-being of those you serve, rather, they also now have access to Catalyst Elite, our high-performance coaching for those with big goals on the horizon, either personally or professionally. Reach out anytime to discuss details, results at CatalystCoaching360.com or visit the website anytime, CatalystCoaching360.com. And now... It's time to muscle up with Julia Coletta on the latest episode of the Catalyst 360 podcast. Julia, it is awesome having you here. We've talked a little bit offline. This is such an important topic, and I'm glad you're here to share with us not only your research, but but just some of your thoughts about this. So thanks for thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Brad. Uh, I'm really excited to chat a little bit more about sarcopenia today. Well, let's jump into that right out of the gate. Some people are like. Wait, sarcopenia? What are, what are we talking about here? Give, give us a little overview of sarcopenia, its connection to aging. You just kind of set the stage for what we're going to be talking about today. Yeah, so that's actually a great question. Um, right now, the literature is pretty all over the place on what the definition of sarcopenia mm. is, but it's classically the coin is termed as the loss of muscle mass and strength and function as we age. And now there's a few different consensus groups who will define it slightly different, uh, differently across the literature. But at the root of it, it's just as we get older, we start to see this loss in muscle mass and strength and function that then can in turn affect our mobility and our independence uh, and overall quality of life as we age. Yeah, and we've had guests in the past, Dr. H.A. Luke, the orthopedist, um, Stuart, that you work with, um, that have talked a little bit about this, but wh- wh- how are we missing this? Like, this is such a big deal. I, I think, I- I don't, I'll be quiet. What, why, how are we missing this? Why is it, why is it getting lost in the literature? I think a lot of people um, are aware of it and we know that it's going on. Uh, The sarcopenia was recently classified as a disease. Mm. So we we're starting to move in the right direction of really trying to uh, figure out what it, what's going on and how to address it. I think because there's some ties between sarcopenia and frailty that distinguishing really the differences between the two is what's important and trying to also just get a little bit more data on the the measures that we're using to properly assess it and uh, trying to just get a little bit of, of a better understanding of what's going on there and how we can intervene and Usually exercise is a, is a good method for that. All right. We'll dig into that. Are there things that a, a family practice doc can, can do beyond the visual subjective, oh, she or he looks frail? Is, is, there, is there something that you would recommend adding to the, I don't know, the, the annual physical that they're going through? Because this seems like something that is not being picked up and needs to be picked up. Yeah, uh, I think that... Right now, there's I'm not sure what they're actually doing in physician offices when older adults come in for that. But a good, easy question would be to ask if they're doing any physical activity, what their habitual level of activity looks like. And in addition to that, is there any 
resistance training or strength training that's being performed um, because we do know that that's one of the best ways to kind of mitigate or slow the decline of the loss of muscle mass as we age as well as strength and function so I think just even gauging what um, purchase or individuals, sorry, are doing on a day to day, uh, might give us a little bit better of an idea of where, where they're at and how we can help moving forward and what things can be prescribed, even if they're lifestyle, um, interventions and treatments. And call me skeptical, but I living in the wellness, health and wellness and performance world, I, I get the sense people overestimate how much they do. So it, it, so, so if I'm coming in, you're my doctor and, and I'm like, okay, yeah, doc. Yeah. I'm working out four times a week. Are you really though? No. You know, like, yeah. watching TV doesn't count as a workout just because you're using your thumb. Um, would there be <laughs> grip strength measurements? Would there be, you know, a, a floor to stand getting up? Would there be number of squats to parallel it, anything and I, I don't think some of this is core to your research, so maybe you're extrapolating a little of this, but any thoughts of what a doctor listening to this could say, oh, I, I could easily add those things. I, I literally, a grip strength takes 12 seconds, and yet I don't think yeah. we're generally testing that. Yeah, grip strength would be a super easy one. Uh, it, there is some good data on it and its associations to uh, mortality as mm. we age. Yes, There's some other functional measures like a timed up and go or chair stands. They're all slightly tailored to different things. So like a timed up and go is falls risk. Um, I think any of those could be done as well as, like you said, the kind of going from standing all the way to seated on the floor. That's a good indicator of where you're at in terms of uh, your mobility. So I think that any number of the functional sh assessments could be a good way to get gauge where an individual's mobility is at uh, quite easily in office. We, we use something um, in our studies called the uh, SPPV, which is a short physical performance battery. And that looks at individual's balance. It looks at um, their, walk, uh, their walking speed and their strength as well as their balance. And the walking speed, I, I'm seeing more and more around that at the extreme, literally VO2 max may be one of the greatest indicators of quality and, and longevity. We're not going to get many 70 plus year old non-athletes on a treadmill to do a VO2 max test. So literally walking speed across 20 feet, like, is this the doctor's hallway? How, how far does that need to be to, to test? Or if people at home are saying, hey, I, I want to check my parents here, they're a little concerned, or I'm concerned about them. How far should they have that person walk to get some indication of, yikes, they're not moving very fast? Yeah, so we typically do, we'll be, uh, do about four meters. Okay. And so it's a four meter walk test, and we'll uh, ask them to go from like, it's kind of mapped out on the floor and then we'll time it. And so there's some good instructions online too, for those time cutoffs, depending on what you're looking for. So it's not quite far and it can be done just within a, a, a small hallway yeah. or just in your living room for the four meter walk test. Um, yeah, even chair stands can be done. That's, that was the other one that's part of the SPPB, uh, that can be done just at home. So you would rise five times out of a chair and then sit down and, uh, it's just a timed measure. So as long as you can check off which cutoffs they have that are kind of published and related to, um, different populations to see where they fall within that and kind of what those that indicates of their physical wellness. So again, many of these things could probably be easily done in the home or in a doctor's office to get a, a baseline understanding of where folks are at with their uh, physical function. Okay. That's good. Um, now the quality and life expectancy, I, I mean, that's sarcopenia is leading to that. And yet very few people even understand what it is. Why does it, why, why does sarcopenia impact those two areas so significantly? Yeah, um, muscle is a quite an important factor uh, as we're aging. So it's something that everyone experiences. And I think it's something that we see a lot when we have participants in for our studies that 
they'll, you'll notice it in ways where your balance is a little bit off. It takes you a little bit longer to get, you know, from your car to the grocery store or getting out of bed in the morning. It just feels slower. So I think folks are starting to notice that feeling that that change in how they move about and do their activities of daily living. But I think that we still don't know enough about how to change that or how to really measure it. So there's measures of muscle mass, like we will use the DEXA or um, there's like gold standards with MRI, but those aren't easily accessible to everyone always. So we don't have um, easy ways to measure muscle mass uh, that are accessible to the population. And I think that's part of it. So we're not really focused on that. We're more focused on how individuals are feeling and like what are these kind of risk factors as they uh, move forward. So I think individuals don't really think, oh, I'm losing muscle. They feel like, oh, I, my balance is off or mm. uh, I'm not walking quite as fast as I used to. So they're, they're starting to see those subtle changes um, that we would kind of deem those as mobility limitations or preclinical mobility limitations. And um, it's at that point where it would be great to intervene. And I keep thinking about, we, we did a podcast episode a couple months ago on 5,500 and 5,000 day targets. And, and so instead of doing annual goals, you break it into three sections. The 50 is obvious. Your, your 500 is about a year and a half. It just gives you a little bit longer runway. And then the 5,000 is the give yourself a chance target. So you don't know, that's about 13 years. You don't know what you're going to care about doing in 13 years. I don't know what I'm going to care about doing, but I want to give myself a chance to have options 13 years from now. So we make decisions physically, financially, relationally, <laughs> you go across the board now so that when we get 13 and a half years down the road, we have the option to do, do those things. If you were a, let's see, let's put you at 75 when you're done. So if you were a 62 year old what 13-year, 5,000-day targets would you set for yourself if you weren't noticing any balance or strength issues at 62? What would you put into your life? What what habits would you implement so that at 75, you wouldn't be noticing these things, or at least it wouldn't be as significant? That's a great question. Um, I think that, again, it's always going to come back to exercise. I think that's the most important thing that we can do. You have to put in a little bit of the work to get those benefits, but being consistent with it, um, doing any type of physical activity that's enjoyable, whatever whatever gets you to do it consistently mm. and regularly is the best thing that you can do. So um, for me, I do like to resistance train. So uh, I can't say as a 62-year-old what that will look like, but getting out, doing, um, going Maybe it's classes, maybe it's using resistance bands uh, rather than being, you know, under the, like the squat rack or something like that. But I think as a 62 year old, I, that's the future goal is to continue to just be physically active uh, regularly and then implement at least a couple of sessions of resistance training per week. And it doesn't have to be super heavy, but uh, a little bit goes a long way. And if you can start it earlier at 62, then you really won't. It will help to kind of mitigate some of those declines you'll see me at 75. Right. Okay, good. Um, oh, there's so much I want to ask you. Uh, okay, so it's not inevitable, at least not at the rate that we would see it in someone who's just being, just, just going about their life. Uh, let's go through, I've jotted a few things down. You've mentioned a couple, but let's dig in each one of them. Uh, the role of protein intake. And I know that's not the focus of your research, but obviously that, that is, it's part of this whole process, especially as people getting older, they're not eating as much. So the, you know, the 85 year old is just not hungry. And, and so to say to them, I think Stuart mentioned 1.2 to 1.6 grams per kilogram is, is kind of the target. It's, it's not the USRDA folks do not follow that. You need more than that. Uh, but what, what would you advise? And let's just go through some decades. Let's say for the 30 to 40 year, 30 to 50 year old, the 50 to 70 year old and the 70 plus year old, what, what, guidance would you give when it comes to protein intake? And maybe this is just off the top of your head more than specific research, but any guidance on that process? 
Yeah, I think that eating protein is great. Um, it, protein intake is one of the most important to promote healthy aging and maintain muscle. So it supports many of the adaptations that resistance exercise would hope to bring about. Um, I think that, like you mentioned, the RDA is not enough. And we, a lot of experts like uh, Dr. Stu Phillips has suggested eating much closer to 1.2 grams per kilogram per day as to about as high as 1.6. Uh, I think that even for folks in their 30s, um, it could be around the same amount. Uh, consuming protein just helps to, again, support those adaptations. And as we get older, it's, it's important to kind of continue with that. So like you said, older adults don't have as much of an appetite and it's sometimes harder for them to get in, uh, get in enough protein, but really encouraging uh, that amount throughout the day. So uh, would be helpful in just kind of like promoting that protein synthesis uh, in addition to the resistance exercise. So I think that resistance exercise is kind of always the most important and the nutrition is just almost like the cherry on top of the cake. So mm. having adequate nutrition is beneficial to help promote um, protein synthesis, but resistance training is, is the most important factor. It just helps to support it. So I think that's important. You can always see the benefits from resistance training in muscle, uh, and then nutrition helps to kind of elevate that a little mm. bit more, just promote it a, a bit better. But I would say, uh, to that it's always great to get protein from natural food sources. So trying to go through food sources first, and then if it's difficult to hit that target, then trying to supplement with uh, an animal or plant-based protein that would be good too. And can you give us some just tip, maybe things that you do or things that, that you were sort of studied a little bit. Um, you mentioned natural foods. It's, it's, not easy to get 1.2 to 1.6 in in a day. Um, any tips on things that you've done or you've had friends doing or something to enhance that process? What, I mean, my basic routine is I, I do some protein powder after a workout. I hit, put a you know a bunch of fish or chicken on a salad at lunch. I've got a little almonds in the afternoon as a snack. And then at night, Suzanne and I will have some sort of protein source with dinner but I'm just, I'm probably at 1.3, 1.4 on a typical day. I'm not, that's not a lot. I mean, I'm not like way over it with that. And I'm really trying. Are there any tips on ways to get a little extra here and there that you've seen or, or tried yourself? Um, very similarly to you, I'll, I, I do like a, like a protein smoothie or things like that. Snacks that are a little bit more protein that have more protein in it are good. So I'll do like yogurts and things like that as a snack during the day. Uh, but it is hard to get up to that 1.6. And you don't always necessarily need to be hitting 1.6 either. Somewhere between there uh, it will do enough to kind of uh, stimulate the protein synthesis. So I think um, what you're doing is great. Protein bars, I've done those as well. But it, it's difficult to get all three yeah. meals and all natural food sources. So especially as you get older, if your appetite's changing, but I would recommend, yeah, just snacks that are, that have more protein in them and just having that kind of be the focus of the meals. Of course you want fruits and vegetables and all that in there too. Absolutely. So folks, if you're doing this at home, you, you basically are taking your, for those of us in the U S that are still using pounds, uh, you're taking your weight, you're figuring out how many kilograms you weigh, then you're multiplying that by 1.2 to 1.6 that gives you your range. That's your target number of grams of protein that you want in a full day. And then you go through and you look at the back of the, whatever, the yogurt container, the protein powder, the can of fish, whatever it might be. And you look at, okay, how much and, and how many servings, you know, so a protein uh, powder that you're putting in a smoothie, it may be two scoops, it may be one scoop. So make, I mean, look at those details. So you get exactly not exactly, but you get in the ballpark of what you're looking at and you're not being deceived. And then also look at the additives. You know, she mentioned protein bars. There are some really good ones and there are some that are basically glorified candy bars. There are good protein uh, powders and there are some that have a whole bunch of other stuff in them. So just do, do your homework. We talk about this all the time, but, but do your homework as you're adding these things in. All right. The second one, role of strength training, you mentioned, you know, even a couple times a week makes a difference. 
uh, what would be optimal? Let, uh, instead of saying what makes a difference, is there an optimal? Is it is it 30 minutes, five times a week? Is You know, as I'm asking the question, I'm realizing your answer is it depends on what you want. Are you going to be a power lifter or are you going to just improve your life? Let, let's re, let me rephrase the question as for the person who's not currently using strength training and is... I don't know, I'm 57. So let's just say in their mid fifties and they want to create a habit. What, what would be your recommendation in terms of time and frequency? Yeah. Um, so there's been a lot of literature on this. Um, there's from our lab group, there's a great network meta analysis done by uh, Brad Courier and Jonathan McLeod. And uh, they talk about this and they, they really delved into what that prescription looks like. And I think, like you said, it, it depends on what your focus is, whether it's strength training or hypertrophy. Um, but overall, I think my recommendation for this would be at least two times per week, which is also in, um, happens to be in line with our guidelines here in Canada. Um, but two times a week, multi-sets at um, a moderate to high load. Even if it's just for 30 minutes, we've seen improvements with that, especially for novice uh, resistance trainers. So I think if you're looking to just kind of be a little bit more physically active, gain some of those benefits from resistance training, uh, two to three times a week for 30 to maybe uh, 30 minutes to maybe an hour and multi-set and doing something that, that you like, right? That's, that's the key factor too, is making sure that you're, you're doing something that you enjoy because that will help you to return to keep building that habit. Uh, and I think that's probably the consistency is key. So anything that can make you consistent is what's going to have the most benefit. Yeah. And I can't emphasize that enough folks. Remember motivation is what gets you in the gym, making it the, making the better thing, the easy thing is what keeps you in the gym. So all that she's saying about find something you enjoy, create a pattern that makes it easy for you to continue it. That's the value. It doesn't help if you get in there and you do awesome stuff for two weeks, January 1st. And then all of a sudden you're, you're back to where you started. Um, you know what, Let, let's talk about this for a little bit. So we lose the numbers I've seen is approximately 1% per year after the age of 40. Um, studies may be slightly higher or lower depending on age, but we'll use that as our baseline. It seems like, and I'm extrapolating a lot here, but it seems like the person who realizes that, so first it's knowledge that this is happening. And then once you realize it, adding 1% a year, that, in other words, I can equal it out if I add 1% per year to my, and now if you're already working out 20 hours a week, that's not easy. But if you're working out an hour a week, that's literally what, a minute extra that you're adding to your routine per year. Am I doing that math right or is that not where, – where are we going with this? What, how do we make up for that 1%? Because that doesn't seem it's, – it's difficult if we're 25 years into it and we've already lost 25%. But it seems like for the person who's listening to this and saying, oh, I'm going to make – I'm going to do better. I'm, I'm, I'm going to pick this up, that they could make up for that without changing their life significantly. Is that realistic? Yeah, I think so. So like, I think if I'm uh, understanding correctly, like starting early and building those consistent habits is what we, we would say would be a more optimal approach because it's much easier to maintain the muscle mm -hmm. than it is to build muscle. Mm -hmm. uh, and this might become a little bit more true as we start to suffer from some of these age-related declines. But I do truly believe that it's never too late to begin exercising. And there's so many benefits beyond just the muscle mass maintenance as well to help make exercise and particularly resistance training, a uh, fantastic strategy for those to age healthily. So even though we might have started to lose some of that muscle, starting at any point, it, you'll be able to gain, you might not be able to gain it all back, depending where you were starting from, but you will see uh, significant gains in muscle, even if you're starting in your 60s or 70s. So for example, we have folks in my study right now who are all 70 plus. And a lot of them are novice strength trainers and they're coming in, they're using resistance bands for our study. And, um, and well, we haven't looked at the data yet because they, they're in the study, but they reported anecdotally that they, they're 
feeling the difference. Like mm. you can, they're progressing. The progressive strength training is a huge part of it too. So it's one thing to go in and, um, and pick up the same weights every week for a couple of months compared to going in, starting at, let's say five pounds for the first little bit, say you're doing like a shoulder press and then moving up to 10, 10 pounds. So you want to make sure it's progressive strength training. Mm-hmm. So that way we can keep kind of, um, adapting the muscle as we're getting older but i think with our older adults they they report feeling a little bit lighter their like stairs are a little bit easier to climb so i think that regardless of whether you've been maintaining your muscle from when you started to see that decline um you'll still be able to build it and it'll still make significant improvements and kind of a a lot of these different measures that we look look at and for the non-athletes that haven't spent much time in the gym is that a easy recommendation for somebody to say, look, do it until you can do 10 to 12 reps and then add a couple pounds and then do it until you do 10 to 12 reps. Is that, is that a reasonable generic target for folks that are saying, Oh, I'm just starting and I've never done this before. Yeah, I would say so. I think that getting up to about, if it starts to feel easy at 10 to 12 reps at that weight, then pushing, uh, increasing that weight a little bit more and trying to, um, trying to kind of keep working up to the 10 to 12 rep range, depending on what you're doing. But I think that's quite reasonable. We use the rate of perceived exertion scale. So we're trying to get folks to be between six to eight. So as long as you're working in it, on it's a really, 10 really point, difficult. I know they've changed that scale over the years. What is, is it? 15 point? Yeah. Yeah. That one was 15 point. Okay. Okay. So somewhere yeah, in the middle. There's a couple of variations. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah. what, if, what about the person who, so, you and I are in the gym regularly. We're, we're kind of looking for that, not pain, like a, an injury, but I feel my muscles working. They're getting tired. I, I can feel it. That's a good thing. I'm happy about that. It's getting me into fatigue and now I can't do it anymore. But what about the person who's never been in the gym and they do 10 curls and they're like, it hurts, but it hurts. They don't, they're not recognizing that's not bad pain. That's, your muscle is fatiguing pain for lack of a better term. What advice do you have for that person? Because it, it's like speaking a different language. It, it, it's how, how do you get over that hurdle of, but it hurts, well, but it doesn't, it's a, that's not really hurt. That's like, but I, I don't know. How do you describe that? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> uh, it's, it's yeah, it's trying to explain that it's not an injury or it's not bad, like like that kind of delayed onset muscle soreness, right? Yes. It's it's good. It means that they're, you're working hard. It won't always be there, um, right? Like if you're kind of consistently doing the same exercises and increasing weight, it will go away. And I think it's just trying to get folks to understand that it means it's working. <laughs> That's kind of like yeah. how I've tried to describe it. I'm not sure if that does a very good job of explaining it. But that feeling just means that you've worked hard, that you're you're helping your muscles and it slowly that will get better. And that feeling does go away fairly quickly. Like that pain, if you will, it's not really pain, but within a, a couple of days, it's gone and they're able to continue doing their regular activities. It won't usually form as good. It won't result in injury. So but it, it's hard to explain to new people that that feeling is a good feeling. It's almost reformatting the the word pain to success or to accomplishment or to, you know, a, a finish line of some sort. When you feel that, that's good. That's you're, you're passing yeah. that next mark. It's not pain like an acute injury. Um, all right, let's jump into supplements a little bit. Again, I know this is not focus of your research, but any suggestions on things like creatine, vitamin D, omega-3 fatty acids, other basics? We do not talk a lot about supplements here. I don't think we need many of those if we're eating well, but are there a couple that could be helpful for folks that are are looking at, at trying to increase their strength? Yeah, I think if we're thinking about just increasing strength and uh, muscle specifically, one of the best ones is um, like whey protein or even some plant-based proteins. Um, There's our lab is doing a few of those kinds of studies and we've seen that 
both way and plant-based proteins can be good to help stimulate muscle protein synthesis. Um, so we would recommend those, I think, as the, the primary. There's, I know folks in it, specifically for older adults, collagen is, you know, sometimes pushed or advertised. Uh, but we, we don't know. regularly, yeah. we, well, we regularly see that it's not that great for muscle specifically. Yeah. Okay. Um, it lacks kind of some of those essential amino acids. So it's not a great um, supplement for muscle specifically. And that's collagen folks. If you, if I spoke yeah. over her there, she is, she's talking about collagen is probably not a great investment of money. Okay. What else? Anything else? Um, we've, I'm not too sure or too familiar with the literature on omega-3 fatty acids, but I know there's some research done by one of our past trainees as who's now a professor at Queens university, Dr. Chris McGlory, and he's done a lot of work around omega-3 and They've shown that it might play a beneficial role in maintaining muscle during bouts of disuse. Um, but yeah. Okay. And then vitamin D, if we're not mm-hmm. outside, if we're not getting sunshine, it's winter months, is vitamin D helpful? Is it helpful, but not in this context that we're talking about now? What What are your thoughts on that one? Yeah, I think that, like you said, vitamin D is important, particularly uh, in colder, darker countries um with winters like here in Canada <laughs> uh, but it seems that as long as you avoid deficiency with vitamin D that you're unlikely to derive any additional benefits mm. from taking more got it that's helpful and then you mentioned the whey protein plant-based protein there are so many like you walk through even a grocery store don't even worry about going to the health food store you go just go to the grocery store and you've got like All these options. And again, folks, first of all, look at the contents. Make sure you're buying mainly protein and not a whole bunch of other stuff. But that aside, is is there do we absorb more when it's whey versus plant based versus pea versus like are there levels of it that you would suggest folks look for? Um, I think that so I'm not sure about the absorption, but leucine is as long as it's got that in there that one's an important one for well uh, to help stimulate muscle protein synthesis so as long as it's got those essential amino acids then i think that um that's a good sign to look out for otherwise there there's tons of them it's just trying to do a little bit more research make sure that the quality of it is good and that uh yeah ways good we've seen some plant-based proteins, just trying to, to look it up ahead of time, but I don't have, yeah. I don't, I can't personally speak on like those key things that you're maybe looking for other than uh, I like to go with whey personally. <laughs> and then leucine, I, I believe that's spelled L-E-U-C-I-N-E. Does that sound right? So folks, if, if you're looking for that specifically, that's, that's what you're looking for there. All right. In, in your research, have you come across any real world examples or stories highlighting the impact of sarcopenia on folks as they do get older and, and how nutrition and activity levels change the game. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, like you, you see it with older friends or family relatives that you, you can start to see that slow decline as they, they get older. And, um, I mean, Given that I study this, I try and encourage my my parents and my grandparents to, you know, do physical activity, exercise and eat protein. But it's hard. It's hard when that's not a habitual thing that they regularly do. But um, I think even with like the participants that we have, there has to be a little bit of motivation to get them in the door to to do what they what they need to be doing. But you do see as soon as everyone starts um, eating a little bit better working out more you can everyone notices the difference and Mm. i think that's the game changer is that if you can get someone to do it i think after the two-week mark is when they're like oh like i've been sleeping a little bit better Mm. or i feel a little bit better and and then it kind of it hooks them in and it gets them to keep coming back i think a lot of it too that we find in our programs is that they're group-based and they work with a registered kinesiologist um, out of McMaster. So we've got something called the Physical Activity Center of Excellence, which is a gym for individuals who are 55 plus. So all of our instructors are specialized to work with older adults, which helps because their ability modified programs and their age appropriate. 
that also helps to, with that motivation and adherence to the programming. But um, that social connection piece is a really big part in terms of um, also just exercising and the impacts of aging on older adults. I, we've seen it through the pandemic too. A lack of social connection has really had negative implications on mental health and physical health. And so uh, I think that the best parts of what we see in our studies is that folks will come in, they'll start to exercise, they'll get some of that uh, social interaction as well through a group-based programming. And although that our current study doesn't have a nutritional aspect, they, they become more cognizant of like what they're eating and that they'll notice that they're hungry or they'll, they'll have the, they'll start to have those conversations with us. And um, they just report feeling a lot better, uh, which is kind of the best part about what we do. And it's why we do what we do. So two weeks, get, get, get it wrong. Folks hang in there for two to three weeks, <laughs> start tuning into those things she mentioned, like sleep and feel a little more hungry and your movement and how stairs are looking, that kind of stuff. All right, so now I want to go down a little rabbit trail that is awesome and irritating simultaneously. And it's that phrase you used it in answer to a previous question of age appropriate. So amazing. That's so great. You've got a gym that people are welcome into. They're not hanging around with crazy triathletes. And I get to say that because I did that. Uh, or, you know, power lifters that are throwing huge weight. So on that hand, it's awesome. But. On the other hand, is the phrase age appropriate an excuse to slide? Do we hit our 50s, 60s, 70s, whatever the 40s? A lot of my friends are like, oh, I'm 40 now. I'm like, you're a kid. What are you talking about? Uh, but are, are we excusing? I don't know. After we interviewed Stuart, we put a little video together on it's not your age, folks. It's the fact that you stop going to the track. It's the fact that you stop doing your strengthening. It's the fact that you... You know, it, it kind of went down the list of, yes, it is, age does matter, but it's not the primary factor. The primary factor is you're sitting on the couch more, you're eating more, you're drinking more alcohol, you're getting lazier, you're using the age-appropriate excuse. So is there a way to balance those two? I mean, this is, you're, you're talking to these folks every day with your research. Is there, I don't know, I'm I'm not really asking a question I'm more asking for help. Like, how do we have age appropriate and not excuse age appropriate? Yeah, I I think I understand what you're saying too. Because well, there's master athletes, right, who are folks who yeah. consistently train for their entire lives, and they can probably lift more than me, like yeah. that kind of thing. They're they're doing great. Um, and I think when we say age appropriate, what I mean by that too is that particularly for newer, yes. Um, athletes newer exercisers yes. that the exercise that the exercises that we're doing we're not getting them under like the squat rack and trying to right. get them to squat and do those kinds of things we're starting very much with body weight exercises um and then we'll use resistance bands they are movements that are a little bit um easier and we're, we're being mindful of different pains that folks are experiencing right a lot of individuals at that age have osteo knee osteoarthritis or hip arthritis or you know like shoulder injuries like mm -hmm. there's different things that are going on once you've uh, lived in a body for that quite that for that time right. and so when we say age appropriate too we're thinking more of just trying to not induce more pain by doing something that could potentially be too difficult yes. that would impact negatively impact their form but trying to focus on things that are a little bit lighter or um yeah just lighter on the body on the joints so that way we can get them to still elicit the same responses but in a way that won't kind of cause more pain and works with the current state of where they're at which could be a, uh, attributed to the fact that they become more they're not doing as much right. anymore um so it's kind of a catch-22 but yeah hopefully getting them back to a point where that pain eases and we've heard reports of that too that they, they feel their walk their knees feel better and they're able to walk further distances and stuff. So yeah, it's a bit yeah, of a, no, I like that. That that's, that's awesome uh, with the audience that you're working with in particular. Um, I don't know. There's something just that bugs me about, I, I don't like people using age as an excuse. Age is a thing. It's not the thing. 
And I, I think that distinguishing line between a thing and the thing is is a message we need to somehow, how, I mean, any thoughts? How do we get that message out to the general population that, yes, age is a thing, but it's not the thing? Yeah. Uh, I, if you figure it out, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to know the answer to that. Oh. It, yeah, I don't know what um, what we can do because you're right. It, it, age shouldn't stop you from doing anything, any of these things. You can do them. Up until we we've got folks at the the pace gym who who've been a hundred and they're exercising. You know, it's it's. I think it's about the mindset, yeah. the mindset that rather than looking at it as oh I'm getting older, this is inevitable. Like this is just what's going to happen right. to me. It's kind of trying to flip that and take a little bit more charge and being like, yeah, I'm aging, but I still want to do these things. And I think that's the key difference between sometimes the folks that end up in our studies. They have this mindset of. They want to um, uh, grow old gracefully, right? Mm -hmm. They want to kind of mitigate that disability and some of the declines that they see people around them facing. And so they're trying to do what they can to um, to make them a little bit healthier, whereas some other people, I think they just kind of lean into it. Uh, but I, but yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't really know. No, I think we're making progress with this. I attended a lecture and I cannot think of the gentleman's name, but he is most of his research focuses on your perspective on aging literally impacts your biometric outcomes related to aging. Like how fascinating is that? And then um, I think what you mentioned, I, I had a chance to go compete in the U uh, S nationals in track. And it was so cool because there were 97 year olds running the hundred meters pretty darn fat. Like they were doing pretty good. And you're like, Oh my gosh, they're 97. This is awesome. So we have those models out there now that we didn't have. And and that's huge. When you can look at somebody and say, oh, well, she had the same career I had. She had the same blah, blah, blah. And wow, look at her. She's doing awesome. What is she doing different? I could do that. So I, I think it's I think it's awesome that we have some of those models. Um, any any ideas around this idea of there's in fact, you you mentioned the staying in shape versus getting in shape I anything there encouragement to folks in our audience who maybe they begin their strength and fitness habits in their forties or earlier versus those that pick it up after they've been diagnosed with psychopenia or they're noticing some of these declines in their late sixties, seventies, eighties, any difference or, or any tips for that in terms of, yes, of course it's easier to start in your thirties. Of course, it's easier to get a good habit going in your 40s, 50s, 60s. But if you're 73 and you're listening to this and you're saying, is it too late? What would you say to that person? Absolutely not. It's never too late to get started. I think that you can do it at any time, at any point. Um, and the benefits that you'll see are just are way better than doing absolutely nothing. So I would always encourage someone if they're ever thinking about getting started to just do it. And that can look like just body weight. That can be, you know, um, practicing some squats. So if you're sitting in front of the TV, watch it uh, yeah. at nighttime, yeah. just, you know, like try and do a squat down, like sit on the couch, stand up, mm -hmm. those kinds of things. Um, we do a lot of the, the studies that we did during the pandemic too were virtual. So we were using household objects to do exercises. So it was like water bottles, soup cans, uh, beans, those kinds of things. Like you can lift them over your head. You can like do a bicep curl squat down with them to add some resistance. It doesn't have to look like going to a gym mm. and doing it a, that way. It can be at home. It can be um small uh different movements that you're just doing or integrating into your day-to-day -day life because um yeah it doesn't i think it can it can be manageable resistance bands are a great way to do it as well they offer a good amount of resistance and a kind of a more accessible feasible way of doing it as well okay so it doesn't matter wherever you are folks it's better than yesterday it's not compared to your neighbor or your spouse your friend or whatever um any other thoughts, and this would be tied in more to your research, but helping older adults maintain their independence as they age. We've talked about exercise. We've talked about protein intake. Any other things that you want to make sure get out there to our listeners that maybe are 
in that phase or they're listening on behalf of their clients or their family members or loved ones, whoever it might be? Yeah. So of course the big driver of my research is exercise and we've talked about nutrition too. Those are important aspects, but I think a lot of the things that we've seen more recently too is social connectedness. That Mm. I think has a very important factor into helping individuals age healthily. Um, Loneliness is a huge risk factor for a lot of health related issues as well. So trying to get individuals um, connected either virtually or connected in person um, is pretty, I think, pivotal to maintaining uh, higher quality of life as they age. Um, I would say that that's probably close up there too with exercise and nutrition uh, as as being something important. Okay, so... I mean, it's so. I mean, we uh, we have things called the four cornerstones, and they're move, fuel, rest, and connect. So that that I love what you're saying here. What about for that person that it's like uh, kind of your get off the porch guy, right? They're they're setting their ways. They're whatever, seventy five, eighty six, whatever, and, and they're like, no, I'm good. Like I don't. Are they good, or is there a way to encourage that person? Yeah, I know you're good. I know you're stubborn. I know you like things, but dude, you gotta, it, it's helpful. Like, do you have that conversation or are you just like, eh, they're, they're good? Yeah, I don't really know. I would say I would err on the side that it's, it's good. Have the conversation, encourage them to kind of get out or go visit, like those kinds of things. I think that it can never hurt to uh, be around more people to feel that connection because the the loneliness and social connectedness is linked to mental health outcomes too, Mm. right? Like depression and anxiety Mm. uh, and those, some of those other things as well. So anything again, in the the sense is better than nothing. So I would always encourage folks to try and even stay connected, even if it's phone calls or zoom, we've seen there's different, people feel differently about zoom. So some people think that it can provide a bit of social connectivity. We've seen other people who say that it's not for them. So it, all of this stuff can be very personalized and tailored to specific people and how they respond to it. But uh, I think it's, I think it's important. Julia, this is so helpful. I, I just want to open up wide open in case I've missed something that you're like, Brad, you got to ask me about this. Is there anything else that's kind of simmering there in your brain? Guidance, thoughts, ideas, anything around the aging process that I haven't asked you about that would be helpful to get out there? The biggest thing is not to stress over the small details, not to worry about Mm. making sure you're doing everything absolutely perfectly. Like, don't be overly concerned if it's not that 1.6 grams and kilograms per day every day, or if you're not getting that resistance training in all the time, or if it's not exactly what you're planned or, you know, a certain amount of reps, that's all that kind of stuff. I think it's very, very easy to focus on those finer details, but getting uh, the foundational items as part of your daily routine is the recipe for success. So well said. Uh, Perfection is so often the enemy. Oh, well, I can't work out an hour. So why work out? Well, if you can work out seven minutes, that's seven minutes more than zero. So uh, that's awesome. Julia, thank you so much. This is really great. Good luck with your continued research. We will have links to some of your studies. Anything you want to send down the road, this is such critical information. We've got to get it out. So thanks for helping make that happen. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Brad. I I really enjoyed this. So many applicable, life-changing tidbits. Speaking of tidbits, if you've been pondering pursuing your MBHWC-approved certification as a health and wellness coach, registration is now open for our next cohort group. The training is done virtually, but focuses on the personal connection with our instructors, mentor coaches, and other coaches. It's a big decision, so please don't hesitate to reach out if you want to talk it over. Not with some salesperson, but with our chief learning officer, the one and only, yes, Susanna Cooper. You can reach her directly, Susanna at CatalystCoaching360.com and set up a time to discuss your specific career plans and how it might or might not fit into where you're going. And now, it's time to be a Catalyst. This is Catalyst Coaching 360, Dr. Brad Cooper. Make it a great rest of your week. And I'll speak with you soon on the next episode of the Catalyst 360 podcast, or maybe over on the YouTube coaching channel.